this being is being live streamed. David, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> doing good. Um, so I don't really know much about what you do. We we had an exchange on Twitter. Um, you're into bison ranching. You mentioned, you know, in our, our brief exchange that a lot of the kind of, for lack of a better term, Bitcoin principles uh, were imbued into this business. And, you know, so I, I'd love for you to maybe just get us kicked off by describing what it is you do and then perhaps why you got into it. And we'll just see where it goes from there. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So one of the things, yeah, that I'm, that it, we're doing is uh, um, we've got a bison ranch um, in, um, in Eastern Oregon, it's kind of a rural Oregon um, community and um, it's kind of my hometown and, and I never really was in the agriculture um, growing up or anything. And it's not a family, family business like is, is typical, but I had a lot, you know, had some friends, had people that I knew that were in it. Um, and over time being in the community and seeing that, that uh, industry sort of struggle, um, even though it's kind of like the biggest industry in the community, uh, it, it seemed like there was very clear kind of decline in, um, in their ability to thrive in that system. Um, and a lot of ranches, you know, just would, the old man would hang on till, you know, in the seventies or whenever he couldn't work anymore. And then really by that point, all the kids had dispersed, you know, to the cities or had other careers and, and really nobody was there to take it over. And so that's kind of really common, still happening right now, where it's just, you know, old historic ranches after ranches kind of coming up on the market and, and usually either um, kind of being divided up or sold to, you know, somebody out of state or something that's going to use it as a. And these are all kinds of ranches, like not just bison, but yeah, yeah, mostly cattle ranches. Yeah, mostly yeah. cattle ranches. That would be the the primary uh, industry there. There's there's a lot of like uh, also farming. Just uh, potatoes uh, is a big one. Wheat. Um, and they just can't make a go of it. If that's why they're giving it up. Like it's you not know, profitable. It, 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 a lot. A lot of them. Yeah. It's. I would say unless they've had a very long term historic um, kind of family lineage. I mean, you know, it's like, the, it's kind of idea where it gets you into the, the monetary pieces, but you know, they, they ends up becoming, you know, the land is basically such a large component of the asset structure of those companies that to justify, you know, once the land appreciates in value to a certain extent, you know, to justify the, the, the business that would have to exist for say a new entrant to come in and support land payment or mm. um or to support that um endeavor on the land in an agricultural sense just gets you know it, it gets to the point where it's not um yeah it's not super feasible and then on top of that and in, in getting into kind of how we're approaching it um you've probably heard some of the terms before like the regenerative agriculture um approach but i think a lot of these places you know the the degradation of the soil um has kind of lowered yields over time. Um, we saw a lot of that this year, even with, it was kind of more of a drought year. And um, and it, a lot of places struggled, you know, just there's, we heard, you know, some places, you know, about half the grass yield um, as a typical year. And so that really makes an impact when a lot of these ranches, you know, would, would be, you know, trying to maximize, you know, the old kind of model is maximize, you know, how much, yield you're getting off the off the, the land you know eat as much grass as possible put as many pounds on cattle as possible and then um and then get them sent off uh to sale uh by the end of the year so yeah so it just becomes they just a margin squeeze you know and then it yeah sold to somebody else as an operating ranch so and so when when they get sold off and no longer are run as a ranch like yeah. What are they being turned into? Are these like becoming suburbs? Are they just becoming like land investment properties? Like what, what's yeah. happening to these places? Yeah, it seems like most of them, the bigger ranchers in particular, kind of end up becoming land investments. And they, you know, I've heard some becoming hunting properties, you know, or things like this, where they're kind of like a uh, kind of like a recreational um yeah. Recreational properties, I guess you'd call it. Um, some, they might, they might, uh, you know, contract out someone to manage, you know, a, a herd, um, on the property, but 
but it's not something that, you know, that rancher has ownership over the, the operation. They're just kind of a caretaker type individual. Yeah. And maybe they do that to, you know, offset some of the, the upkeep and property taxes and all that. Right. Uh, and in your, so. in that area, the type of ranching, how, how would it, I guess, diverge from what listeners to this show are probably becoming familiar with regen agriculture. And, yep. you know, yep. a lot of people have listened to what untap yep. has done, like sure. what, what, what style of ranching is happening in your area, which is kind of causing this sort of um, approach or this sort of degradation. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's typically just like your typical traditional ranch. Um, they have been slowly consolidated over time. I mean, this is, and, I, and this is all for me, probably a journey um, trying to understand the, the, the business and industry of agriculture in the last say three years, as we looked into starting the bison ranch. Um, but so I, so I've had some limited travels outside of it and it seems, seems similar elsewhere where it's like, you've kind of had these, these family ranches for the most part. And this is in the smaller communities. I think there's, you know, there, there are bigger ranches that, that, you know, in, um, you know, Montana, California, different places, any, and even Eastern Oregon as well, where they've, they've kind of developed into a bigger industry, but I'd say the most common scenario is, you know, a family run ranch, they might have, you know, three to, you know, eight employees or something like that. Um, and I think they just have seen a slow degradation, degradation in, in the soil and, and typically, so typically the most of the ranches they'll they'll try to calve out really early in the year so it's which is not a not really a natural you know not really a natural thing if you look at any like wild animals or any of that you know you, you're not having babies in in january or february but that's that is the case for most of these ranches because the the system that they have is they end up being um kind of put in this place where they're, they're just trying to extract as much production from their property as possible within a year's year window. And this goes back to the financial piece as well, but yeah, uh, they, they'll try to do that and then sell the calves um, by the end of the year. So by kind of about this time of year, um, maybe December, depending on the year. Um, so it's a very, they, they, it pushes them back to early season, calving which is really difficult hard on the hard on the cattle hard on the rancher uh and then um, try to get as much weight on those cattle as possible to then sell them usually to they just sell them to like a sale yard that then gets a certain market price for the cattle um those get then sent to a feedlot then feedlot uh to processing facility um which most of those are owned by um the processing in particular is kind of kind of consolidated into about four, four big processors, um, nationwide. Um, and so most of the, the cattle are going through that system. Um, and what we've seen, and there's, 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 um, uh, info on this that you can find, but there's about, uh, the latest thing I'd, I'd heard was the rancher. So it's someone that does that model, you know, that just, just basically produces the cattle. And then once they sell them at the end of the year, they're done they only retain about 18% of the, the final, you know, retail value of the product. So there's all this right. extraction, you know, in the, in the, the, um, you know, post kind of processing of the animal that's getting really, you know, taken away from the producer. So the, the rancher basically breeds the animal, they get them to a certain age or strength or, or whatever. And, it, yeah. it, and do they do that in like open, free range sort of environment. Like that's how they're initially brought up. And then they, they get sent to these feedlots where they're kind of crammed together and fattened up as fast as possible. Right. Is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially where, where we're at, um, yeah, that's exactly right. They'll breed, they'll breed all their, all their viable female cattle. Um, uh, they'll, they'll calve out early in the year, like I said, and then they'll, they'll tip, they'll feed them through the winter, feed hay. Um, and then after they wean the, the, well, actually they won't wean the cows till later, but um, but they'll then, as soon as they, you know, as soon as the grass kind of greens up in the Hills, then they'll usually, a lot of these ranchers will have either, um, tracts of land that they, that they own, or oftentimes very often like a uh, Bureau of land management or forest service, you know, leases that on public land that they'll kick them out in the summer months. And then they'll put them out, you know, kind of on range and then gather them back up in, um, 
you know, when the grass is, is done, usually uh, later in the summer. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah. And then at that point kind of sort through um, what they can sell and maybe they keep some replacement females for the next, next season. Um, but yeah, that's, so they're, they're typically, yeah, they're typically kind of, kind of more, um, more free roaming cattle in that area, just because that's the, that's the resource that's there. I don't, I don't think we have any, you know, feedlot operations in our area, but um, a lot of that more in the Midwest. Yeah. I know this is a relatively new profession for you, but I'm mm -hmm. assuming you've had some discussions with old hands, people that have been in, in yeah. the business for a long time, because you mentioned how the financial circumstance of the world as it is right now, or more relevantly in, in the U.S., really squeezes these producers and therefore they have to put the pressure on and squeeze their animals and their land and all that kind of stuff. Have, have they, you know, communicated to you specific things that have changed in the recent, like five to 10 years, like what the, how that squeeze has manifested? Cause you, you know, as you say, a lot are either not being populated by the, the children of the ranchers or they're being given up for other opportunities or because the land is more valuable to some other use case. So right. like, ha have you heard from them like specifics about the squeeze, like, and what's really difficult to overcome yeah. for them? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the interesting thing is it's, it's like a lot of things. It's so multifaceted. I mean, it, and it's particular to, to each operation, but I think common themes are, um, you know, degradation of production, um, mixed with increase in, in inputs. So a lot of these, all these ranchers too, they'll be using, you know, they'll, they'll hay their ground. Um, so all their good productive ground, they don't actually graze that typically they'll, they'll grow hay on it all summer when they kick the cattle up into the Hills and then, um, harvest that, that, that hay to, to then, uh, feed through the winter during the winter. Yeah. Um, so the price, you know, so a lot of times they end up becoming, you know, I've kind of noticed that they'll, they'll end up becoming more of this sort of like equipment uh, operating and, and troubleshooting, you know, kind of is, is more the like career than really animal management or, or, um, or managing the natural systems uh, because they just, they just in that business model, that's what's required to make it happen. Um, so, you know, then that affects, you know, cost of fuel, cost of, you know, tractors, parts, um, you know, all of those things are continually going up. Um, and, uh, and cost of labor, um, is another one. And so they're getting squeezed on all the cost side, but then the, on the, on the, the product value side, you know, with, which is the way the industry is. And a lot of these, these, you know, cattle, because they just do go into the feedlot, you know, major processing systems, you know, you're in buyers or, you know, fast food restaurants or, you know, just really low, you know, kind of these, these companies that are going to squeeze down the margin on what they're willing to pay. And so yeah. they're kind of getting it from both angles there. Um, That's brutal. So, so like yeah. the, the processors, <laughs> the processors and the feedlots can kind of Walmart the producers yes. and say, Hey, I don't care if your inputs are going up. I want lowest prices. And then they're just between a rock and a hard place between, you know, energy inputs going up like hundred percent year over year. And yep. then not being able to pass that on to their buyers. Yep. And yeah. So I was just, just looking at a fertilizer. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this recently, but just this, this week, the fertilizer prices like going parabolic. <laughs> just, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, it, and so more, more ranchers are kind of throwing in the towel and just being like, this is no longer worth it. And I guess that has a couple of effects. One, ostensibly it reduces the supply of meat mm -hmm. raises the price of that consolidates more power in the larger businesses that yeah. have access to capital and financing and all that kind of stuff and just kind of worsens the situation that befalls them in the first place and i guess this is where work like you're doing and joel and others in the regen community comes in because they're attempting to take a totally different approach to both animal and land uh and trying to compete in this environment, which it's great to see the, the consumer preferences shift and prioritize those new methods. And they will pay more within reason for those. That's been my experience, right. you know, yeah. but it's even better that these operations now have access to a 
inflation or cost sink, which is Bitcoin, which can help balance the pressures that are being exacted upon them, as we just mentioned, yeah. by rising input costs and stuff like that. So yeah. unless you have more to say about the kind of legacy environment where you're from, what was the what's the entry into what you're doing now? Yeah, I mean, and that was like the original the original thought was we were going to try. We had some kind of kind of some historic property that we had access that I had access to kind of through family connections. And the original thought was to just kind of like, Hey, let's, let's maybe do some ranching and do some experimentation here. It wasn't, wasn't originally to, to do a regenerative operation. And then just like we, we detail, you know, like I went and looked at, you know, come, I come out more from the business standpoint and was in, and I've got a close friend and, and, uh, and, and buddy of mine that, that's the ranch manager, you know, he, I brought him in and we started brainstorming how, how we could potentially do this. And we just started realizing like, this looks really bad <laughs> from like a business standpoint, like it's like a lot of risk, a lot of capital, you know, deployed up front. And then maybe, you know, you get enough at the end of the year and you don't control any of that anyway, you know, the, the pricing and all that. And so, we kind of originally were, were looking at that and we're just really discouraged. Um, and then, and then started stumbling upon, um, some of the, the holistic management, um, framework, uh, which is Alan Savory. Uh, it's kind of one of the original, um, kind of voices in the space. And then of course, Joel Saladin and Gabe Brown and, and a lot of these others that have been doing it for 20 plus years, uh, somehow kind of, you know, um, in this, <laughs> in at the fringes, like a lot of these things, uh, start. And, um, uh, and so we just went around and started, you know, visiting places and learning and, and it really, for me made a ton of sense because I kind of, what I applied to other spaces and other, and other business endeavors was a sort of like, you know, first principles approach, um, and, and really looking at it as a system. And once I kind of was able to connect that for ranching and for, what was actually happening with, you know, with the, there's just sheer physics of it. Like you have, you have sun, sunlight is the main input, uh, from outside the system, everything else is, you know, contained on the earth. And then you've got, you know, the soil structure and, and water cycle and microbiology and fungi and all these different pieces that interact. Um, that was just like the hook for me from an intellectual standpoint of, okay, this is, ranching and agriculture had always seemed really simple uh, growing up. That was like the friends that I did have that were in it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the idea was like, Oh, you just, you might stay in the hometown and just, you know, live a simple life. And that was, that was kind of like the way it was portrayed. And so it was really fascinating to me to see that there was like this unending level of complexity that one could explore, particularly as you, you looked at, um, basically paying more attention to the specific, you know, kind of locality and even species, you know, whether it's grass or, you know, the animal species yeah. um, and, and the interplay between those. And that, that just was like, I mean, to me, I still feel like I'd know nothing, you know, and it's one of those things that, um, that really fascinated me. So, so yeah, that's, that's, fu that's kind it's of funny. You, it's funny you say that because, you know, that that kind of farm simple life is is understood to be one way and it's like oh i'd rather go to silicon valley or austin or whatever right. and be a part of a uh, graphic design start internet startup <laughs> and that's like yeah. way more intellectually stimulating and like on, on the edge but it's like what's more intellectually stimulating than understanding the life cycle of or how food is grown and how that life cycle takes place and all the different elements that allow it to be robust and productive and healthy. And then how that, I mean, that's obviously our biggest consideration as human beings is how we sustain ourselves with the food that we eat, yeah. you know, and how all of that mixes together to, to produce healthy food in a sustainable manner for us as individuals and for the environment that we're using to do so. And I'm yeah. sure, like, as you said, like you, you barely have probably scratched yeah. the surface of understanding all that stuff. And like, I get it in, you know, in the current culture like it, it's not something that immediately stimulates people but i do think we'll probably see a revival of interest in 
I don't know what, you know, ecology, ecological sciences or how all this melds together and how to optimize it in the proper way, right? Not optimize it by just, you know, strip mining it and optimizing it for yield and putting in all these additives and inputs just to max production. But how do you optimize it so that all the different constituencies, the environment, the animal, the human beings that are using, uh, you know, it for sustenance, how all of them are, are optimized together you know it's yeah. super fascinating to me yeah and I, and I find that really it's I think it'll be an engaging you know this is just kind of like the the motivating factor for me to like make it into a business you know it's one thing it's like okay I find this really interesting intellectually but it was like this idea of like I think there's there's so many people that you know you, we I think a lot of people you know, that I know and that, you know, whether, like you said, they're, they're working maybe some tech job or something like that, but it's like, almost everybody is like, you know, the being in nature, you know, they, they're either, you know, wanting to get out and go run or hike in the mountains, you know, be outside. And it's like, I think almost anyone could imagine, you know, having, if that was the, if that was a job where you could be outside, you know, all day and, and be in that, that it would be desirable, but then just the harsh reality is it's not viable, yeah. um, from, from a monetary standpoint. And so there's a huge, huge piece of the motivation for me is like, is there a way to, to design sort of a, a company that they could exist and actually, you know, have the potential to bring, you know, kind of caring, intelligent people into that system and, and for them to apply that sort of growth mindset and curiosity, but have it actually pay off uh, from a business standpoint to where you could get that flywheel going and you could bring more people into that, um, you know, that environment. So, yeah. Um, were, were you, yeah. I, I'm not sure if you mentioned already and I just missed it, but we're like, why did you guys start looking before we get into the specifics yeah. of, of the solution? Why did you guys start looking at ranching in the first place? Was this part of your background in any way? Like, what did you yeah. do before looking into this as an option? Yeah, it's, I, <laughs> no, it wasn't part of the background. It was kind of like, interestingly, all around me. And I just was very much oblivious to it um, growing up there. Um, I think, I think it was sort of, I think, it, I think it was sort of this desire for connection with, um, with the land coupled with, you know, kind of understanding all these problems that are, that are going on in society. And, you know, initially I was very, you know, very interested in kind of, you know, environmental issues and, 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 uh, you know, climate issues, those kind of things, but then really found it to be, uh, for lack of a better word, just kind of de depressing, like, like, highlighting the problem, but the like solutions, particularly for the individual that you could contextualize as like, what could I do, you know, besides say riding my bike more or, you know, or some simple, like less consumerism, those kind of things that, that what, felt empowering to like, okay, we could get out here and, and do something. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. And I just wanted to, I'm just curious, yeah. like, cause in the big, like a lot of us Bitcoiners, yeah. We looked out on the world, and we saw lots of problems too, right? And whether it was three years ago, 10 years ago, whatever, I'm just curious, which problems were the most salient to you? Which ones were the most that like impacted your thinking about wanting to go a different way or contribute to something different? Yeah. It sounds that, like environmental concerns yeah, were a part kind of, of it. Kind of a mix of, a mix of everything. I mean, it's kind of those things like I, I do, I'm really attracted to kind of, you know, the systems thinking and, and so I saw the interplay between the degradation of the environment, but also like of our own health and food systems. And, you know, clearly like the food systems aren't upholding the environmental integrity super well and, and haven't for a while. And so that was clear, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, but it wasn't, I did, I like I had a brief stint where I kind of got into like permaculture and, and kind of thought about doing this sort of, I was living more in the city at the time. And so like, you know, more kind of intensive, like kind of city, you know, gardening, forest gardening type thing. Uh, never really, really got um, far enough into it. But so that the, co the concept was there and that was linked to, linked to kind of the environmental questions. Um, but, I, but I've also been interested in like, you know, the bigger scale, you know, kind of history and geopolitics. And so it, for me, um, yeah, like 
Bitcoin for sure, uh, but also yeah, this kind of like regenerative agriculture and how it expressed itself to me in the last couple of years and how I found it um, really seemed to like, yeah, just, just click in a way that pointed towards an optimistic future um, in a way that I just felt like it just couldn't find before. It's like the problems are clearly, you know, somewhat clearly identified um, or, or they're very apparent, um, but it just was, it just was progressively more and more negative. Um, even just like, you know, conversations with friends or whatever. It's like, you can only get around and talk about problems for so long before you're like, right. man, I'm tired of talking about problems and like, yeah, like do something else. <laughs> and, so. and just for the, the, the timeline here, when did Bitcoin yeah. enter the scene? Cause I'm, I'm I suspect yeah. that at least somewhat changed your perspective on how a solution might coalesce or, or come yeah. together. Yeah, it was, it was somewhat concurrent. I think, um, I think I, I came across regenerative agriculture a little bit prior, probably in 2019. And then Bitcoin for me had been on the radar in 2019, but it was really kind of like, you know, now probably there's a, there's a certain class of, uh, of Bitcoiners that, that fall in this category, but very much kind of like similar time as like the Michael Saylor, uh, you know, rabbit right. of like, I had done some investing in, in the stock market and, and uh, probably, probably since like 2017, 2018. And, and you know, things kind of made sense and you're like, okay, I can kind of maybe identify companies and things like that. And then, you know, after the, the 2020, uh, you know, crash and, and then the, the Fed response to that, it was like, I felt like nothing made sense anymore from, from the macro and economic landscape. And, and particularly when you look at, you know, looked at specific stocks or those kind of things. And, and uh, so that, that for me was, yeah, that the point at which I really was like, okay, I got to figure out what's going on. Cause I didn't, I didn't understand it anymore. Um, and that was, I think we had already had about 30 bison at that point. So we, we had kind of started that um, process, but it, um, but I wouldn't say like the synergies between the two, I'd say those started to click a lot more uh, in later 2020 and, and making that realization that, um, that it could, you know, one could really benefit the other um, from, and, and they're both very long time horizon type, you know, type of, uh, activities or, or thinking required for, uh, for them. So, yeah, well, I, I'd love to know how the, like the continued understanding about what Bitcoin is and where it fits into the world, yeah. how that, uh, informed what you're doing now, but maybe we should pause that and just okay. get into what, like what you're doing now and how, it, how it actually came about. Yeah. So, so right now we've got, um, we've got about 200, uh, bison um on a piece of property that that we actually purchased um which you probably wouldn't have purchased it without without the the bitcoin um investment uh if i really really think about it that it made in in early 2020 um kind of with the comp with our company's reserve so were you renting land before because you said you had some bison before we, well we had yeah we had some family property that uh that so my my dad had and, and grandparents had it was kind of low production kind of um um range land so it wasn't it was and it never was a ranch um a ranching property it just was um something we had we were we had typically leased it out to cattle ranchers in the past. Um, and so that was the original idea was we'd kind of leverage that to kind of get our foot in the door, kind of figure things out. And so we, we had, yeah, we had about 30 bison on that, uh, that piece of property, but we knew that, you know, running kind of the business models and whatnot, we knew we needed to have a larger place to really make it work. Um, which is really difficult. I mean, I, I, I've listened to a little bit of like, you know, untapped uh, gross stuff. And, you know, he talks a lot about, you know, ranchers needing to farmers needing to kind of like own the, the, the property. And, um, and I think that's critical for a lot of reasons, particularly when you start looking at the models that you have to use for regenerative agriculture and, and sort of the longer time horizon and sort of this investment you're making into your soil 
you're you're unlikely i think to do that if you're leasing property because you're you don't know how long you might have that lease you know you could be kicked off at any time and in the end you're still even if you do fix the soil um increase yield on that on that property over the long haul um you know you're if you don't own the land you're not you might benefit from the from the increased production um if you can continue to lease it but you're not retaining that value that you've created um in the soil and so um where i was going with that i think i think basically the thought was leasing was kind of out of the question i think at that point we kind of figured if we were going to do it we had to kind of make make the leap and find a piece of property that would allow us to do that. Um, and so it was, it was, yeah, one, the property we ended up getting, um, it's about 650 acre, uh, ranch, um, old sort of like irrigation methods where they just, they just flood irrigate off of, uh, off of kind of the, the river and it, you get a certain amount of water, uh, different times. And, and then there's, there's different, little trenches and can channels that you can kind of flood parts of them to, to put the water out. So it's very, very kind of low tech. Um, interestingly enough for, for what we do, which kind of gets into the weeds of some of the management practices you have to do for the regenerative ag, but, um, it actually was a benefit because when you, when you do the regenerative ag, you're wanting to get sort of a, uh, a higher level of, basically call it like animal impact in the smaller area. So there's, there's the idea to do that is you have electric fencing, you contain the animals for a certain amount of time. Usually, you know, kind of we're shooting for like a daily uh, one day at a time. And then you move them each day to a new section of grass and kind of repeat the process over and over. And the idea with that is it, it fertilizes the ground um, because you have very concentrated, uh, you know, the, all the animals come, they poop all over and it's really concentrated. They're not all spread out. They're pretty close together. Kind of the hoof like impacts into the ground will kind of depress certain areas and, and kind of activate the soil a little bit. Um, and then also only allow them to eat so much and not be so selective in what they eat. And then before it's kind of overgrazed, you're moving them to the next area. Well, one of the like bottlenecks of that approach uh, is livestock water. So animals have to drink a fair bit of water a day. Um, and if you don't have water for them to drink, you know, you've got to basically, you know, engineer how you're going to get the water to them or else this whole, the whole system really doesn't work. Um, but with this, this property had a, um, all this flood irrigation. So that all these like trenches of water that would go to different parts of the, the property. And so we're actually kind of utilizing that structure, which was designed for, for growing grass, uh, alfalfa and hay, um, mostly in the past, um, using that to, to also give us a lot more water points for livestock, um, as well. So the, the ranch had historically been, um, they, they would grow, uh, they would grow hay for about half, half of the property was all just grass production for hay. They wouldn't even graze it. Um, and then the other, the other half, they would in the past, this had been a, it'd been a branch and had been leased out for 30 plus years, um, to a local, local rancher. And, um, and then it, the, the owner, um, I think either though, I think the original owner passed away. And so the, the family was kind of, um, selling off the estate and then that's when it, it came up. This was last summer. Um, and so, so yeah, we ended up, uh, buying that property, um, and, uh, and just completed kind of this sort of fencing and infrastructure and corrals and different things that are particularly because they're specific to bison. You have to have kind of taller fencing and a little more robust corral system and those kind of things, uh, just completed that actually like two weeks ago. So it's kind of fully fully happened kind of from a, you know, it's pretty blank slate and is now, I would say a functional bison ranch. <laughs> awesome. And how, how big is the land and how many heads are on it again? So 650 acres. Um, a wow. lot of it's irrigated. So that helps. Um, you're kind of like, 
uh, production per acre. Um, you know, cause a lot of times, yeah, if you're in, if you're in dry, like rangeland, I mean, you might for 200, uh, you know, 200 head of animal, you might need, you know, 3000 acres, you know, depending on how much grass is on it, you know, it's, it really depends on that. But the, that's the other, that was the other piece for the regenerative ag approach, uh, is having it be a smaller, uh, property, and, and you have basically the, the more sort of like production per acre you have, then you can kind of get that um, when you're bunching the animals together, it's easier just functionally to do that on a smaller piece um, than it is on, you know, bigger, a bigger property, just because of the fencing and, and water, like I mentioned required, you know, that you have to move to different areas. If you can kind of do that in a more concentrated uh, location, um, I think there's, there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, but we haven't really seen, you know, we're just getting started on that side of it. So we haven't really, you know, um, been able to reap the specific benefits of the management style yet. Um, right. it's all been about infrastructure and getting that going, but, um, but that's the plan you, uh, going into next year. Do you guys get, win- uh, snow in the winter? Yeah. Yep. So do you have to grow for that or is there some other solution? Yeah. So this is something we, I don't know yet from experience, but we've, we've seen and, and, and read of different, uh, different ranchers being able to, they call it stockpiling. So you can actually grow enough grass, uh, and you just, you would leave it and then you could actually graze in the winter and even particularly bison, um, will eat through the snow, dig in the snow (laughs) and, and eat, uh, this year we'll have to feed hay. Um, and kind of the goal is basically to kind of wean ourselves off of feeding hay in the winter. Um, Mm. a lot of ranchers will kind of say that you're crazy to think you could ever do that, but, um, but we've seen, seen that that's possible. And, and this is kind of a good segue into kind of why bison too, but that was my next question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, (laughs) Because part of that is it, bison have a lot of really unique features that um, that are different than cattle. Um, I, I suppose backing up cattle, interestingly enough, I I think there's nothing wrong with cattle per se, but it's but the system of agriculture that we've had for say you know 50 years um, in particular just incentivized this sort of, well, the dynamic, like I was talking about before with the traditional system where you're trying to create the biggest calf possible uh, by a certain amount of time, because that's what you're paid on. So if you have a, you know, a 700 pound steer at the end of the season or a 500 pound steer, you're going to get paid more for the 700 pounds. So, you know, all these ranchers have incentivized to, basically go after these genetics that, you know, um, select for pounds per day, you know, uh, added to the animal, um, at the cost of, you know, many other things, including, you know, you probably hear like a lot of ranchers, you know, hate calving season because it is so much trouble and you're sometimes you're pulling calves out of cows because they don't, they don't birth well. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that because they just haven't been selected for say ease of calving because, you know, and, and the calves are getting bigger and bigger, uh, because <laughs> they want them to start bigger and end bigger. Um, and so it, it just, it just creates a system where there's so much input from every angle. And that could be from the rancher themselves inputting more time and effort just to keep these animals alive. Um, they're not as robust, uh, against disease. They, you know, so then they need antibiotics and they need, you know, hormones and all these different things to keep them, um, keep them resilient. But the, I think the, the root goes back to sort of the economic system incentivizing, you know, growth and size of the animal above all else. And then, cause you get these animals that want growth, you have to have calories to, to achieve that growth. And so then the, the view of the land also reflected that of like, okay, that's just the resource to, to extract those calories, put them on the cow. And that's, that's the end goal. Um, so for bison, uh, 
it you're kind of in a totally different scenario where there's like there's no breeding programs really for bison and they're they're still pretty much um you know kind of kind of their natural kind of wild um genetics um there's there's some debate you know i haven't really gotten into it uh, you know of, of sort of what's a pure bison and what's not there was there was apparently some in inbreeding of cattle genetics back quite a while ago and because bison kind of went through this like um more or less i guess for lack of a word like near extinction event um in the late 1800s where they went from like there was estimates of like 300 to 600 or not 300, 30 to 60 million bison kind of like pre westward expansion, um, European settlement. Uh, and they would range all the way from Canada, all the way down to Mexico and basically the entire great plains of the U S you know, were just That's bison. so rad, man. You just know, to so think was, that like that many animals used to just yeah. like make their way down such a large stretch of land. It's crazy. Yep. Yeah. And, and essentially they would just kind of follow the grass and, and, and they didn't really have a lot of like predators because, you know, maybe like you got wolves and, you know, some, some carnivores that would, uh, you know, try to pick off some of the weaker ones, but they're just so big and, and resilient animals that I just don't think they, there was a lot of predation on them. Um, and, and, you know, that kind of was their demise in a lot of ways when, when, uh, you know, Western man came out and, you know, had guns and stuff because they just the bison would just stand there because they that's still their their instinct today if you kind of apply pressure to them like you would like on a cattle drive to kind of push cows along they'll typically instead just turn and face you and just stand there and like okay like we can do this you know and then you're like, okay, <laughs> you win and then and you know you give them the space but uh but yeah so they're just not really there's not a lot of fear um that they display which is which is really cool um but anyway, so that, yeah, they, they kind of went through this, you know, I guess, you know, kind of bottleneck genetically. And, and now there's some wild bison, you know, in Yellowstone and, um, in a few areas, but it's mostly all, all on private ranches at this point, the population, I think, I think I had read the latest figure was like somewhere in like 500,000 head total. What? Uh, US. So it's, you know, gone from yeah, 30 to 60 million to, to 500,000. So um yeah so so pretty pretty interesting um so yeah you're basically getting you know you're getting bison from you know one of a handful of places you know that are kind of in a, in a region um and we happened to find some in idaho mostly and then there was there was one ranch that was uh, an older guy was kind of selling out in northern california that we got ours from um so so yeah they're basically genetically they're they're there's just bison. Like they're not, they're not really, there's not really options or other, you know, breeds or anything like that. Um, but really when, when you looked at kind of running things with this intensive grazing holistic management approach, um, I think they're, they're pretty ideal, uh, creatures for that. Um, just the resiliency and then going back to kind of what spurred the, the thought was, you know, with the winter feeding and their ability to, to get into under the snow and feed, they actually metabolically, uh, really, um, I don't know what there, there's some, uh, I haven't been in the research recently, but it was like their metabolic, um, output in the winter slows down to such a degree um, that, that they just, they eat way less, you know, they'll actually lose some weight during the winter, but they'll, they'll gain it back on, but it's, but it's very, um, yeah, very, very crazy where a lot of the like modern cattle will still need, they'll still run hot all winter. Right. Um, so you're quasi hibernation or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously their coat and stuff is very well adapted to actually heat and, and cold. Um, they they'll they'll get a big you know big kind of woolly uh coat in the winter and then shed it off in the summer um can you do anything with that can you do anything with their uh, coat? Yeah, like you, is you it can. marketable it, it gets it's pretty like it's a pretty high-end kind of like expensive product um there are people that do it you know and, and tan the hide and and all that um you know it's something we might look into but it yeah, i don't think the demand is is super high for it right now and right. just because of the costs and everything um 
you know, and there's some, some demand for like, you know, using the like bison skulls and those kind of things, but, um, but those would be fairly periphery to, to kind of what we're, we're looking at, which would be mostly, you know, grass finished, uh, you know, meat would be the main, uh, product. Yeah. That, that was going to be another question. Like is, was another part of the motivation aside from what you just mentioned, like does bison meat fetch a higher market price these yeah. days, or is it increasingly in more demand? Was that part of the calculus? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, that mixed with sort of like the, the genetic characteristics and resiliency of the animal. Um, and in with the business model of, okay, if we're going to, instead of, instead of just move our animals to some processor that doesn't really know us, doesn't care. And then however they market that to the end consumer, we have no idea. Like the, the thought I had and it seemed really obvious was we kind of had to do that ourselves and right. basically maintain control and vertically integrate from, you know, the animal being born all the way to the end Retail. consumer. Yeah. And then when you're doing that, you know, you start to realize that what you're really selling is a story and a narrative of, you know, how was this animal raised and, and what did it do? And, and what, what's the, you know, what's the nutritional value of, of the feed that it was eating and therefore the meat that, that, um, you know, it became, um, and the only way to really do that with integrity, I feel is to kind of be able to tell that story, you know, entirely ourselves. Um, and so it's kind of like, yeah, that, that, that becomes then sort of the brand, uh, identity and approach is telling that story authentically. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And then that was, you know, looking at the meat prices, um, typically bison, currently right now, you know, just kind of roughly compared to another grass finished, um, say grass finished beef, uh, is about, about 50% more than grass finished beef and about double the price of a feedlot finished beef. Um, so fairly significant, especially if you're looking at, you know, the, the grass you're producing on the land is really your product. Um, the, you know, everybody, you know, ranchers a lot of times think that the, the beef is the product. Um, really, you know, the grass is what, what your, that is your, that's your resource. And, and ultimately, actually, if you dig even deeper, it's, it's the soil is kind of like what you should be optimizing for. And then just this, you know, optimal soil, uh, produces, better grass, better grass produces better animal. And then that's you're into mark, you know, your two market approaches is, is the animal clearly, but, um, but yeah, it has to all kind of go back to that, the anchor of the soil structure and, and then what's going to produce that and compound, you know, the, the, um, compound, I guess the, the, the health of that soil over, you know, just indefinitely, um, is the goal actually. Mm -hmm. And so the, I'm assuming the animals just breed naturally. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if so, like, how do you manage the space required? Like, will you keep having to buy neighboring land or maybe not even neighboring because yeah. you could buy other places and send them over to a, a different place. But that's the idea. Like the herd keeps growing and that's kind of a part of the equity mix. Cause as you say, like the equity in the ranch is also the soil is, is the yeah. grass yeah. But is that the idea that like, and, and I know this is, so, you know, somewhat insensitive, but the yield is the meat sure. that yeah. you yeah. sell into the market, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what, those are, these are insightful questions. Uh, yeah. So the, the, there's a couple interesting things with bison in particular, the breeding is all kind of like, um, not it's, it's basically, you're not able to manage the animals in a way to selectively breed because they just aren't, they won't, they don't, they don't Which fuck how they like, yeah, they don't really, <laughs> they don't, they don't want to, they want to stay together. They want to stay in kind of one main herd. And so, and so typically is the practice is yeah, all the males stay intact. There's no, like, you're not castrating like they do for cattle. And then you're not selecting your bull to go with these females and trying to, you know, trying to do things. They're just, there's, you know, the dominance hierarchy and, and the alpha bull sorts it out, bull sorts it out and everybody else gets the seconds. So, uh, 
So there is some concern with that approach. You know, you've got to kind of like um, some of the, the female calves, you, you do have to kind of, you know, it only go so many generations of, of breeding before you've got to kind of like either create a new herd with, with new bull genetics um, to, to avoid getting too much of a kind of inbred uh, genetic structure. Um, How do you track that? What's that? How do you track that? You just yeah, know so, who's breeding what and you like you keep track of how many it is and somehow you segregate them or what? Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to know which bull in particular. Um, but we just know there's only, you know, there's only about uh, I think we've got about um I think it's about eight, eight or ten bulls that that are kind of our breeding bulls. And so then when we will sort them once a year, we'll run them through corrals and we'll tag them. And then we know kind of like, you know, what generation they were and then what bulls we had at that time. And then, and then this is all developing because it's like, you know, we, sure, we sure. started this, but that's kind of how the teams explained it to me and, and the thinking that we're, we're taking. Um, are those eight bulls kept separate from the rest for a period of time or do you just like uh, they might in the winter here we might uh we might pull them uh separately um but but it's kind of unsure i mean the the, the big thing with bison as well is just like handling them is kind of a uh it's it's a bit stressful on the animal plus a bit dangerous you know for the human and so we're hoping we've designed like a good system on our corrals to to mitigate some of that but they're just the route it's like big animal and they're not, they're not used to that, um, you know, that, you know, kind of confined environment. And so they try to like, I'm just, think, I'm just thinking of like eight, like ready to go bulls coming into like a <laughs> pen of like 300 and they're like, they're yeah. just like, it's time to party people. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> We're here now. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's interesting. So they don't like the rate, like, um, typical cattle will the females will cycle um year round you know kind of you know constantly be cycling and so you have to you have to actually that's why they'll actually select when they put the bulls in um whereas with the bison they'll they'll only cycle uh a few times a year usually kind of early summer and then in the fall kind of a traditional kind of what you think of like with elk and stuff like the rut season you know kind of there's some cycling right now um, so you'll see that behavior start to happen. Yeah. Like the, in those times, you'll see the bulls like, Oh, they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're on, on heightened, uh, you know, alert here. And they start, you know, they start doing the, the dominance behavior. Otherwise different times of the year, they're just like, you know, they're just super docile and like, you know, look like they wouldn't, they wouldn't really harm anything. You know, they just kind of want to eat. And <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, is yeah. I don't know how much you've uh, listened to untapped stuff, but you know, my impression from yeah. how he's described his operation is because of the approach to the land, because of the selection of the, the genetic selection of the animals, it's fairly hands off, you know, like the breeding yeah. happens naturally. I'm getting the sense that it, maybe it's a little bit more involved with bison. Is that a correct? Um, yeah. I mean, I would say we're not going to be, super um and you have to like maybe rotate them on the the the, the land more often too because i think you said like every day you you move them around yeah we're that's that's the aim is to do to do it every day i mean you can you can do it less but it's it's um the key is that with the kind of intensive rotational grazing or holistic management or there's you know lots of names for it regenerative agriculture it's kind of a big umbrella term it's the key that I've kind of dis distilled it into is you've got to get the, the size of the paddock and the, whatever the, the feed content of the grass in that paddock, you kind of get the ratio, right. Where you can, you have to be able to change the behavior of the animal. And so there's a certain point of like congestion, if you will, that once they get to that point, whether it's cows or bison, they start to realize like, Hey, if I don't eat this piece of grass right in front of me or this plant, even if it's, you know, there's could be forbs or could be other types of um, grass or, uh, or plants that they realize if I don't eat this, like the animal right next to me or behind me is going to eat it. And so they, they start to not be very selective in, in what they're eating because they can't. Um, 
And, and so that, that has a lot of implications on the grazing then that's different. If you, even if you leave, you know, animals in for, in a paddock for, you know, say three days or a week or, you know, and you, and you rotate, it's still better than, you know, maybe just leaving them there till they eat everything in sight, but they will, they won't feel that pressure to, um, to change the behavior of how they're eating. They'll still want to go around and select, you know, the nice tender, you know, green shoots or different, you know, the tougher plants that oh, I don't want to eat that right now, or it's not quite ready or things like that, where it changes how they, they graze. Um, and so that's kind of like, the goal is to find what size of, um, you know, of paddocks and this will, this will be dynamic through the year because it's like, well, how, what's the grass like at this time of year, if it's April, it's going to be a lot different than June or, you know, and one area might be better production than another area. And so it's all going to be about what size of paddock, uh, can feed that amount of animals and yet, not have them overgraze and change, but still change that behavior. Um, and, and then, and then move them on to the next. Um, yeah. And then probably because we're on irrigated ground, you know, if you're not on irrigated ground, if you're on dry rangeland, you really can only probably graze it once per in the year. Um, because you want to have enough recovery time for the, the grass to, to kind of get that stimulation of being, of being eaten. And, and, and when, when the grass does that, if it, if it just, if it just gets one kind of one quick hit and a kind of an acute shock to the system, the grass will kind of put down more root structure and kind of try to be, you know, get, get more resiliency and then it will kind of grow back stronger. Um, but if it just continually gets grazed, uh, you know, as soon as it starts to recover a little bit and gets hit again, um, then it just gets, you know, just, it just can't, can't thrive there and we'll get out competed by other, either other plants that the animals are not selecting or, um, you know, or it's so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super complex. It's like that. <laughs> yeah. It, it's like that. I don't know if you've ever heard Peterson detail the experiment with the mice and how they play. Right. And if, if the dominant mouse doesn't let the smaller yeah. mouse yes. win like 40% of the games, then the smaller mouse stops playing and then there's nobody to play with. Right. Yeah. And so there's that, there's that, trade-off and there's that responsiveness between the, the mice and like it's so interesting to think that there's like some kind of not exactly similar but some kind of uh almost intelligent responsiveness between how the grass is being treated and how it responds to to its environment in that way you know it's like yeah. well if you eat me too much i'm just going to give up but if you yeah. eat me a little bit then i'll eat, come back even stronger yeah. you know it's yeah. super interesting yeah, it's very clear that the grass co-evolved with, you know, sort of migrating grazing herbivores um, because otherwise it won't, you know, essentially an environment that's never grazed, um, which is kind of an interesting dynamic, you know, because you have this, you know, there's a certain part of kind of environmental um, culture that would be like, just don't touch nature at all. Just leave it alone, um, which you know, maybe, you know, maybe at certain times, you know, we, before we had so much human civilization and fencing and all these different things, you know, that would sort of work, but, but it's like that were that worked in the past because you had, you know, you had millions of, you know, bison say on the great plains and they would just move wherever they wanted to and follow the grass. Um, whereas now, um, you know, we just don't have that. And so, you know, if you leave these grasslands ungrazed, they'll eventually, if given a long enough time, there's like this succession of, you know, kind of shrubs and then kind of, you know, scrubbier trees like juniper trees, that kind of stuff. And then eventually become forest because they just, it doesn't have enough stimulation and enough um, activity that the grass requires that sort of, you know, push and pull of like, okay, I, I'm getting eaten, but then I can kind of like recover and, and it, and it, the, the grazing animals kind of keep all the other longer term, um, and the grass does as well, as well the root structure of the grass will keep those shrubs and different, um, plants from, from out competing. Um, but as soon as that goes away, it, they're not, they just, yeah, the, the grassland won't, won't stay around, which is really, mm -hmm. really fascinating. Yeah, totally. So I'm guessing that you guys haven't harvested any animals yet because the, the herd is so 
new. Is that correct? Right. Well, so we we have harvested some, um, probably about uh, about a dozen or so over the last because we did have the smaller uh, the smaller herd or, uh, before, and then we've we've basically it's kind of been a mix of some animals early on that we purchased that we knew we were going to to butcher, and then some that we have ended up culling uh, for one reason or another um, from the herd. And so we, but we haven't, yeah, you're correct in assuming like we haven't actually had, so we've got a kind of our first crop of, of calves from, from the females this year. And we've got about a hundred and I think it's about 115, 120 calves in addition to the two. So that, this is another interesting thing I learned in ranching is like, so when they say 200 head, that's actually just like the, like the adult, uh, animal. Right. So it's like the, right. mostly kind of the female, um, breeding animals. And so then there's, there's 200 kind of adult bison plus a hundred and 115, uh, calves right now. Um, so, um, so those, because we're grass finishing, you know, you, you actually don't, you know, they would typically like in a traditional cattle operation, you know, that goes to the feedlot, you know, they would be going now, um, because they were born this spring and, um, or they'd be going, you know, going soon. Um, but because we're, we're going to grass finish, you know, we'll actually keep them over till next season and then finish them on fresh grass, um, in the summer. And so they'll, we'll, we'll butcher some, um, some in the, um, well, and depending on when they're born too, it might even be 2023. I think we, we've factored 2023 was our, our first year that we would have, um, kind of our full harvest, uh, you know, and it's really going to be interesting on the development of so we're kind of putting in place this production system which is the ranching and and the grass and the management and then the next kind of 18 months are really going to be how can we execute sort of the back-end system of like getting these products to market which is a whole different thing which i think is also disconnect for a lot of traditional ranchers it's like well i don't want to like i know ranching i don't know you know, like marketing, or marketing, or, sales, yeah, and, and internet, you know, <laughs> how to like, yeah, distribution and sales and all of that. And so that's going to be a big focus of the build out um, for the next 18 months. Cause we have to go from selling just a handful of animals uh, in a given year. I think we did like eight this year, next year it'll be about 20 some. And then it goes from that to like 120. So it's like a very big jump in production and then therefore the sales that that we have to have to do in the in the bottleneck for any uh producer that's wanting to go to straight to market direct to market like we're going to do this is grass-fed beef or or bison is the the butchering uh processing capacity so these like small scale butchers that that will be willing to do kind of a, a finished animal like that um they, I think hopefully there's been enough of a resurgence in demand for this, that they'll, they'll start thriving, but it, it, they definitely were an industry that was, that was also kind of dying. Um, uh, I, I would hope that, that now that that's not the case, like we're, for example, like they're, they're booking spots for, for processing capacity, like over a year out, um, right now for like these small producers that are uh, at least in our area. So you're, you know, we're already like, like most of next year is already spoken for it's like already into 2023 for like processing capacity for, for these types of, um, you know, kind of grass finished direct to market, um, USDA, um, licensed facilities. A couple of questions off the back of that. So how long does the bison live like in your, on your property before they're harvested? It sounds like two to three years. Yeah. So mostly would be, yeah, it's about, um, yeah, a little over two years, two, two to two and a half years would be most likely um, the, the length of time that, that any of the younger bison would, um, would stay on the property. The, the bulls I, I, I hear, and this is something we'll have to kind of play by ear over time, but they're kind of like peak out, um, you, you maybe like when they're eight or 10 years old, but then like the, the cows, the, the breeding females, they'll, uh, We've heard from some of the other bison ranchers that they'll go till like 20 or something, you know, like super pretty old, which is much older than, than beef cattle. Um, right. Which would be more like, you know, kind of like 12 to 14 years would be like a pretty old cow. Right. For, yeah. And so the, the butchering 
do you do you decide not to do that in house just because it's easier to get you know a specialized yeah. butcher to do that or you don't want to you know yeah um yeah it's like that's one of those things like i actually want to do it in house um but it's it's one of those of like how ambitious are we going to be and and what uh what kind of execution risk do we have um and it's something that i don't have any you know any experience in and so i i have a hunch that we will probably find ourselves doing that as well um Right now, that would be the only kind of piece of the process that we wouldn't do. So we would bring the animal, you know, to, to kind of finishing weight um, on grass, take it to the butcher to be processed. Then we would get back kind of packaged product um, with our labels on it, that thing. And then we would do sales distribution of either individual kind of packs of meat, uh, steaks, uh, burger, that kind of thing, or some wholesale probably mostly burger wholesale to like restaurants. Um, we have a couple even local restaurants that are already, already carrying, um, carrying some of it. Nice. So, um, but yeah, I, I feel like we probably will need to do if we want to keep, keep, you know, expanding and have some growth trajectory there. I think a processing facility, um, either kind of partnering with someone to build one or doing one ourselves will be, in the cards. I think a lot of the, a lot of the bigger regenerative, um, agriculture, uh, operations like white Oak pastures in Georgia or, or Gabe Brown in North Dakota, they, they all either have a processing facility that they own themselves or, um, or have kind of co-opted with a, you know, handful of other ranches to, to ensure that they have that, uh, capacity. What, I mean, what would the expected revenue of a, a you know, a, a head that you sent out for processing, mm-hmm. like maybe final retail value or something like what, what's the calculus yeah. there? Like for a bison? Yeah. So depending on the outlet, um, cause if you're doing like restaurant sales, you're kind of looking at more of this like wholesale price versus, you know, direct to consumer kind of final retail value is higher. Um, the range is probably, uh, probably about um, four thousand five hundred to seven thousand dollars an animal, something like that. I mean, seven thousand would be like you sold everything direct to consumer online, yeah. directed, you know, in in individual packages, and kind of forty five hundred like all to restaurant, which is is high for the the ranching world. Um, you know, a lot of like the cattle ranchers, they'll, they'll sell like, you know, if you're getting, you're selling a, a, a steer at 700 pounds or something, you know, it's like, you'd be doing well to get, you know, a thousand dollars or $1,200, you know, for that, for that animal at the end of its end of that sort of like their production cycle. That's kind of like the end of it. It's shorter because it's all within one year. Um, so there's a difference there where you're investing more time and more management of the animal longer. Um, but, but going back to that rancher retaining 18% of the value, uh, that's the price you pay rather than, you know, in theory, if we sell direct to consumer, um, I guess if we're, if we're outsourcing the processing, you know, we, we do lose that percentage, but everything else, you know, we would retain. And, and the, the nice thing to me is you have control over that in a very decentralized, you know, sort of local way where it's like, in theory, our property, you know, 600 some acres, will, you know, be a self-contained system, um, of production that doesn't re- re- require any, you know, real outside input, um, other than just kind of our time, attention and labor and the animals doing their thing, you know? So, yeah. um, and which is uh, super freeing, uh, yeah, to think about that. for sure. <clears throat> and I feel like once you establish a brand and start to get that client base that's just super loyal right they they know why you're doing what you're doing they appreciate it they value it highly like i feel like this kind of should have sell like hotcakes like you you'd probably be you you'd probably be the biggest issue would be not being able to right. to meet all the demand right because yeah. people want this type of food particularly people in the bitcoin you know yeah. network um they appreciate the narrative behind it, as you were saying before, like the stewardship of, of the earth and the animal and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just kind of a no brainer. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's super exciting. I'm, 
I've always prioritized health and like this, it's been access has been the most challenging part, right? right. To get high quality uh, meat and food like this. Uh, but Reese, and I've, I've only been out hunting once, you know, I'm kind of ashamed to say it, but I, uh, when I was home two summers ago, I went moose hunting and, and we got nice. a moose and I'd always wanted to, I always hated how I just go into the grocery store and pick up, you know, a plastic wrap package off the shelf and, there's, there's just no connection to your food when it's that way. Right. And I I wanted to be face to face with the sacrifice required for me to sustain myself because I wanted to be acutely aware of like what was being given up in order that I might continue my life because I knew that that would imbue my, you know, my life with a greater sense of responsibility. I would think like, Oh, like, you, you just put a bullet in this animal so that you could survive. What the fuck are you going to do with that gift that you've been granted? Right. Yeah. And yeah. like, don't get me wrong. I, I don't walk around all the time, like <laughs> being a manifestation of my highest self. Right. But I, I wanted to be con- consistently reminded and face to face with like, what, what is required for me to, to continue my life and how does that inform the decisions that I make and the principles that I try to embody and the, you know, yeah. the life I attempt to live. And so I'm, I'm curious from your point of view, being so up close with the life and death, the life cycle, let's say of the process that you are now involved in, has that influenced you on like a personal quote, you know, slash spiritual slash, I don't know, deeper level? Yeah, no, I, I think absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, that and, and so many other things, but it's, I think you, you hit it right on where it's like, and what I just was, couldn't help but think, but it's like, it, it just contextualizes the, I don't know, I guess like the fragility and sort of the impermanence of life. And, and like you mentioned, like this sort of like idea that the animal sacrifice was maintaining your, your existence. And, and it, it shortens that chain of connection to I mean, in the hunting case, like to literally the moment, you know, and that immediacy. Um, but even in ranching, it's, 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 it's so much closer. Whereas like, you know, and I, and I, in college and, and after college kind of experimented with, you know, vegan diet and all kinds of other diets and, and a lot of it spurred kind of by the sort of environmental awareness standpoint. And to me, the, the biggest weakness of that is like this, it's just abstracting away, you know, that, that connection. Okay. You're, you're thinking you're doing less harm in a way, but, but these sort of industrial systems of agriculture that are producing all the, the soy or corn or, you know, you name it plant that is creating anything. That's not a, you know, not a non meat product um, that, that could potentially, you know, have enough calories to, to sustain, you know, a, a life um, a lot of times is really really unhealthy for the soil and, and, and the, the ecosystem. Um, but it's abstracted away enough that it's like, you know, you just can't, you can't personalize it and contextualize it like you can when you see, um, you know, see exactly where the, the, the food is coming from. And, and particularly with an animal, like, you know, you, you know, where it's lived its whole life and, and the connection to that, I think is, um, yeah, it's, it's very real. And, and, yeah, I think, I don't know. There's, there's so many ways I could go with that, but it just, yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, I think it, it probably just, just like I said, yeah, just the connecting it to just that the immediacy of you could literally, you know, be sustained on something that's right, right in right around you and not, not abstracted away in, in the systems that we have, which, you know, there's benefits to that. Um, in certain areas of life. And, and I feel like we're kind of walking in this like one foot in one world, one foot in the other, uh, you know, as far as food systems go, because it's like, you know, you've got, I've got kids and, you know, you try to, some days you're, you're trying to do all this and you're busy. And so you're, you know, they're, they're eating, you know, fruit loops or whatever occasionally. And it's like, you can't, there's like this dissonance or like, I know this isn't where we want to go, but, um, but we're kind of trying to build that future world concurrently. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, and the existing world is so set up and so perverted 
to make those choices the most convenient and the cheapest ones yeah. and the most appealing. Like you take your kid in the grocery store and it's like, oh, yeah. well, there's meat and veg over here right. or there's a <laughs> bunny rabbit with rainbows and colors and all this kind of shit. And it looks happy and great. And inside the box is literally death, right? Dead right. food, right. horrible nutrition, <laughs> sugar, like all that kind of shit. I oh, mean, yeah. it, it speaks to just how perverted things have become. And I think you know, broadly speaking, what I think having this relationship that we've just been discussing is like it's increasing the reverence for where your food comes from and, and how, does, how does that reverence permeate different elements of your life, your vitality and your respect and your sense of purpose and meaning and all that kind of stuff, which I think, you know, if the fiat world completely has detached us from so many elements of our reality, but in this case, let's say where our food come from, food comes from the importance of our food, the importance of our soil, the importance of the environment, the importance of that relationship of reverence, it's just completely severed that, then things like what you're doing and the ethos that seems to be emerging largely in the Bitcoin space is about returning to that, yeah. right? Closing that gap again, removing the perversion and being like, what, how do humans act? How do they feel? How do they determine value, construct meaning, all that kind of stuff when they're more uh, in sync with the environment that they evolved in and that they engage with and that they derive sustenance from and that literally gives them the fuel to be conscious, you know, free thinking, free agents in the world, right? And then it, it just seems like an unavoidable or unarguable, I guess, trend that's uh, occurring right now. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, now may be the time to break into how Bitcoin has influenced sure. the thinking around all this. Like, you know, I think the, the layup is like, well, you put it on the balance sheet and you're probably going to yeah. be insulated from some of the, the craziness yeah. in terms of inflation that goes on. But obviously there's other elements as well. I'd love to hear yeah. your perspective. Yeah, no, that, that is, uh, that's, yeah, the, the immediate, you know, benefit is, yeah, the, the, the sort of number go up benefit of like, yeah, putting it on the balance sheet at the right time. And it's like, okay, you know, we're doing pretty well on that that choice now. Um, but I think it's like, to me, it's those connections to the way that the physics works in the natural system. And, and you look at the soil and, and, and everything there. And there's, you know, kind of that idea, there's like, you know, there's no shortcut and there's no free lunch and it's a, it's a closed system um, other than the sunlight coming in to the system. Uh, you know, Bitcoin reflects that in the monetary system where it's, you know, it's, it's that closed system where it's not going to be, you know, the, the, the total supply is not going to be changed. And so the value created in the system stays in the system um, rather than being extracted away to, you know, whoever's controlling, uh, you know, the inputs. Um, and so in the traditional agriculture system, you know, it's, you know, big, uh, you know, chemical companies, fertilizer companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies in a lot of ways, processors, you know, are, are extractive to that system and to the local uh, land that, that the product's coming from. Um, you know, it's like they're exporting their, their, their nutrients and soil resources and then importing, you know, the, the fertilizers and chemicals to try to replace those, those lost, um, lost nutrients. Um, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of parallels there to, uh, to draw with, you know, with the financial system and, and kind of that ex exportation of, of value and sort of the core, um, core value created by society. Um, but, you know, through that, you know, through the sort of, you know, just through that hidden theft that, um, whether it's inflation or just, um, kind of the, the fiat mentality that you speak to that changes you know changes all those value structures so it's it's i find it like almost funny that you know you have all this perversion in the system the subsidies and the messing with the money and the inflation and the the changing in the value proposition of land that's created from the hyper hyper financialization of everything yep. all yeah. this all these distortions like a torrent of distortions and then if you just like put Bitcoin on there, it literally sucks in all of those distortions yep. and spits out something that like almost in a commensurate way counterbalances all of that. Like that one move, you can rectify all of that distortion, you know, perversion, fuckery, all that kind of stuff. 
with this one little move. And that will, that will spit out a, uh, I guess, a amount of value mm-hmm. that is commensurate with the perversion, right? It's the perfect counterbalance that will allow you to uh, weather it or move through it almost as though the perversion didn't exist, right? To, 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 yeah. to, to help nullify it, I guess, yeah. you know, and that's amazing. You know, yeah. it's amazing to think that that now is available to so many people. And so all of those businesses and services and, and all that kind of stuff that people have been yearning to, to build, right. But have been looking out in the landscape and being like, Oh, the, the obstacles are too insurmountable. Look at all this, you know, distortion out there. We can't possibly do it now because of this tool, you can look at that and say, Oh, we actually can do it. And so what's going to emerge. I mean, I think this is the reason why I was interested in speaking with you is like, these sorts of things will be increasingly thought to be potential, like possible, right? Whereas yeah. before you might've just looked like, like you were saying about the ranchers in your area that were just like, we can't fight it, you know, fuck it. Like yeah. the generation's not continuing. We're selling the land to some investment firm, whatever. Now these people can say like, no, actually we, we can actualize that thing that we think is right. And that we want to do, we have a, a tool now to aid us in insulating ourselves from the deleterious effects of all of this intervention and perversion. And so what yeah. are we going to see as a result of all these people all around the world now being able to act on what they think is right and good and what like their yeah. impulse for creation. So yeah. exciting. Yeah. And I, and I love how Bitcoin essentially it's just going to like seek out, you know, true value creation. you know, like, you can't, unless you're actually producing something of value, you know, you just are not going to make it, you know, in, the, yeah, in that system. Exactly. And, and that is like, and I've tried, you know, it's like, it's, in, it's an interesting world to like, you know, for me, the technology piece is not, not hard. And that's kind of where I came, came to it from initially, but, you know, trying to like blend this world of like, you know, cowboys and, ran- and ranchers that, you know, in, in Bitcoin, but I think it's, I think it's a match, you know, from a value structure, it's this perfect, uh, perfect match because, you know, that's what they value, you know, socially, it's like hard work and productivity and, um, you know, kind of reliance and, 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 you know, self-sovereignty in a lot of ways. And, and well, it's a perfect so marriage. It's, it's just, it's they, marriage. they think it's foreign, but it's yeah. so similar to the principles yeah. that they live by, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, for me, like this, this sort of the future that I envision kind of for like, you know, for my, my kids, especially is this, this sort of marriage of, you know, the best of technology, um, you know, kind of led by Bitcoin and, and sort of that the return to value creation and honoring those type of occupations and, and hopefully making this company and brand that, that is sort of this, like, you know, this, this harmony of, you know, let's, okay, let's leverage technology to, to be more intentional about what we're doing on even a smaller section of land rather than, rather than technology be this less lever that, that makes us, you know, dominate the land and, and roll over it with, you know, even bigger and bigger, you know, tractors and machinery and kind of just industrialize it. It's like, it's a decent, more of a decentralizing technology that, you know, we, we use to, um, you know, to go further and learn more about, you know, the kind of like microcosm of just like this one little piece of property or, or the, in the soil and the, and the, the creatures that inhabit that. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there. And then sort of the, the value structure that comes out of that and the ethos of a culture that, that potentially lived that I think has implications. And that's, I mean, you, you do a great job of highlighting kind of Bitcoin's way of creating, you know, this sort of quasi like spiritual transformation in, in people and their lifestyle and their choices and behavior. Um, I think, I think um, proper agriculture will do something similar and, and Bitcoin will be really will go hand in hand with that. And um, I couldn't help but thinking when you were, you were talking a little bit ago about this and, and it's kind of bringing in some of the, some of the stuff from, from Peterson and, and Maps of Meaning and, and sort of that perspective uh, is this idea that we culturally need to sort of re like, like instantiate new sort of rituals or like 
a sacramental way of being that 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 brings about sort of like this 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 heightened level of meaning and connection that I think you know it's like more that that fiat mindset and culture is just like you go into a job and you're trying to mine your fiat as fast as possible and then you and then you're buying products as cheaply as possible so you don't you know uh you know you don't you're trying to get that sort of you know value uh conversion um, but there's just no, the, the meaning's totally lost. And like you said, and then, and then what's in, what's inside of all that, and that, that lifestyle and products is like, it's empty and it's, and it, it's not sustaining. Um, and I think there's this, yeah, this large hunger and we see it, you know, whether it's in the political landscape or, or elsewhere of trying to, yeah, trying to find like a new sort of, a new re- religion in a lot of ways, that, that provides the context for meaning in people's lives. And, uh, and it seems like that's going to have to be, you know, it, it's going to have to be created, um, in some ways, maybe not, maybe not by completely abandoning the old, uh, traditions, um, in all ways, but, and I think there's a lot, you know, that Peterson's been really instrumental to me in sort of kind of re, um, like reviving or like uh, reinvigorating a lot of some of the, you know, the older traditions and mythology and, and, uh, and Christian tradition. And, um, and of course that's, you know, Christian tradition is definitely a big, big piece in the ranching community as well. It's, it's still, it's still embedded fairly well in that culture, but it's, it's kind of like, to me, it's not actualized in the way that, you know, it's like if, if people really realized you know, what that value structure meant, you know, it's, it's too, it's too, um, yeah, like in, in, in kind of the country, you know, country culture, if you will, it's like, it's too, it's like, it's like pop, you know, it's like pop culture Christianity versus yeah, like, yeah. you know, like th- that it actually like would change the way you orient yourself and how you do business and how you raise a family and all those things. So that's I was a bit of a rant. <laughs> no, I love I love it, man. Rant all you want because like that is exactly what I've been spending a lot of time thinking about lately. And there's a lot there, but just to to touch on the last part first, it's like I agree that the vast majority of people that are quote unquote religious in the world today, and and I am making a judgment call, and obviously, you know, <laughs> a- apologies to the people who this yeah. does not apply to, but. I feel like, you know, they grew up in a religious family, most likely they take the standard doctrine as like, kind of like, well, dogmatically as a set of rules and like this, you know, they label themselves as X, Y, Z religion. They more or less try to abide by the rules if it kind of fits. Um, And that's the extent of it. Whereas I think you're exactly right where what's the religious enterprise is really, you know, an effort to determine the meaning that most compels behavior, right? And what should be the meaning that m- most uh, properly or accurately constructs a, syst- a value hierarchy, a system of valuation that is in most in line with like the invisible structure of reality that we interact with such that doing so elicits the most successful, meaningful life possible and successful, yeah. not in like right. billionaire status. Right. But like, however we define like a content soul, like a, a content, joyous, uh, you know, a live reverential, you know, that's really hard to describe, but yeah. I, I think you kind of know what I'm, I'm getting at. Yeah. Like what it's is fulfillment uh, and yeah. 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 And like, I think that is uh, uh, you know, once you sift through all the manipulations and the bullshit and the power structures and all that kind of stuff, that's what that enterprise is trying to determine. Yeah. And it, it's almost impossible that that won't be co-opted, which is why I think it's, right. it is so much the responsibility of every individual to determine what that is for themselves as much as there's an allure to just say, well, my family is this way and look at that doctrine. It's really nicely packaged and lots of smart people have thought about it. So I'm just going to take it off the shelf. There's a lot of wisdom to be discerned by investigating those various religious doctrines and schools of thought and philosophy throughout the ages, but it's still, you should be the authority in determining 
the meaning that you find in them and that you can use as your own scaffold for, or yeah, use as a scaffold for your own construction of, of value and meaning, right? And, yep. and I agree that I think clearly religion as it has existed up until now, like it clearly needs updating of some kind. Again, still lots of wisdom there. And I think a lot of people have been awoken, awakened to the value there by Peterson's work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but there's a reason why it's become a less important aspect of our lives. And like you said, like, I don't think there is a post-religious state. You know, a lot of people will, might yeah. recoil at that, but like, I don't think there's a strictly rational existence. Like there, there is the, always the element of the unknown or the chaos or the pure potential or whatever you want to call it, the void. And the relationship to that and the potential that it contains yeah. is kind of what that enterprise is about. It's like, how, how do you have a relationship with pure potential such that you can live a, an increasingly creative and, and content and joyful and beautiful life as yeah. the circumstances and environment of your life unfold and change? And I think maybe one of the reasons why we're in the situation we're in is because of such a rapid change in our circumstances and environment and our landscape of of information knowledge and meaning that yeah. the former um systems of interpretation or systems of trying to convey the wisdom of, of that relationship are no longer as salient as they might be and yeah. so i think what's happening now is like we're in a bit of a crisis of of that kind yeah and look i mean what i've been thinking about a lot lately exploring on this pod trying to put down in words is like I don't know exactly what relationship Bitcoin plays in the rejuvenation of that relationship, but I'm, I think it's, it might be central. Like yeah. I think what Bitcoin represents and how it influences our systems of valuation and uh, the elements that are instantiated in it and what it produces as a result in terms of meaning, in terms of value, in terms of communication, in terms of correcting these systems of, of distortion and, and perversion and as Peterson's term, pathological hierarchies, mm -hmm. I think it may be representative of that relationship to reality that religions have tried to articulate, but in a form that is not only contextualized for a quote unquote modern world or the landscape right. that we find ourselves in, but also simultaneously a real world tool of doing so and not simply uh, an idea or a set of an ideas or philosophies or beliefs or faiths. Yeah. Um, and so that's obviously pretty much the largest statement you could make, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like yeah. nothing really gets bigger than that. And like, it's not that I want to make it. It's that I, it's increasingly unavoidable. Like I'm having a hard time not seeing it that way. And so if that's the case, I mean, not only is this exciting for all the reasons that we've been describing that it writes a lot of the wrongs in terms of the, the perversion and the theft that's been going on, but like it may also, and perhaps maybe even more importantly, or simultaneously be like a new nexus for the construction of and transmission of meaning yeah and yeah you know, no i i and I, and, and the final the final yeah, sorry the, the the reason why i went on this whole rant in the first place is because what you said when you finished yours was because if that is true it necessarily transforms behavior yeah it's like you don't, you don't need to attempt to be a, like there's still an element of agency but like when you encounter a truth that's so compelling yeah. It transforms you and you, you conform to it in a certain way, almost effortlessly. And that may even be the hallmark of the, how genuine the truth might be. And that's what I, I see. That's what I think is so powerful. And of course, I observe in, in Bitcoiners, broadly speaking, is like, and some of it's conscious, some of it's subconscious, but that this is having like a, a profoundly transformative effect. And I think that's because the, the truth or the meaning that it contains is so compelling and yeah. i that's what that's what the things of the utmost meaning does or do yeah i and i i think it, it what seems clear to me is it's like and maybe where the where, where the connection point is is it's like you know we have these laws of of physics and 
you know, kind of the natural laws of the universe that kind of bring order to, to the natural world. Um, and, and invariably you cannot, you know, that the, it, that brings about a certain truth, you know, like you hear talked about like, you know, different podcasts and stuff too, like, you know, you're, you're not going to argue with, you know, gravity or you're not going to like, you're not, you're not going against, and we've, we've oriented ourselves in a way to, okay, we, we have to adhere to these laws of physics. Um, and we have to operate and behave within that context. And I feel like what Bitcoin seems to do clearly is somehow, you know, it, it bumps up that, that sort of, structure and, and natural law, if you will, to the sort of information and social and economic layer yeah. where we were able to decouple that, um, you know, in, in the last few hundred years and, and, and disconnect from the natural world. And we have like the natural world and we have this world of like human action that is, that is disconnected, you know, or we, or we thought so. I think, you know, I think in reality, it was kind of a temporary sort of decoupling that we're being brought back to by, you know, many different, um, many different factors, but Bitcoin sort of just pushes that, that sort of natural, natural law and order up to those, those secondary layers. And like you mentioned, that's going to then require a change in behavior to adhere to these new, these new rules that, that are not, yeah, are not controlled by anyone, um, but are irrefutably, there and and as it proliferates the the effect i think will in the consequences for not orienting your life in that in that way to respect those those new laws will will grow like the consequences will be larger as time goes on and so that that will change the incentive structure and the the choices that people make um and i think when you start looking at and you do a great job of this on the podcast where it's like, you start looking at how, when your economic choices, and then that therefore changes your choice as a career, which is linked with, for a lot of people, kind of their identity and their sense of belonging and meaning, all of those get shifted and reoriented to a new center. Like what that has for the impacts on the individual um, and the way that, that we will orient We'll have to orient ourselves and and towards things of of value, um, and and hopefully of of you know more meaning and purpose. Um, I think that that impact alone, um, yeah, just it's it's hard to hard to know what the like the downstream impacts of that will be. And I sure. love you know for for me like Peterson hits that you know so well as like some phrase of like you know, the sort of like salvation of the world is going to be kind of a, as a consequence of like the, the transformation of the individual and, and, 100%. and that individual, you know, pursuit of like, and what, what can I actually do? What can I fix today? And like, like go do that and, and see what happens, you know? And then, and then it was enough people have to, you know, start reorienting themselves around that. Um, whether whether by choice or or because um, you know things move in that direction, you know via you know maybe maybe how how Bitcoin ends up affecting those economic incentives um, forces that. Uh, either way, that confrontation that the individual will have to have with with truth and with reality, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I guess it's, it can, it gets kind of speculative of like what that will cause, but I guess that's what you're trying to do here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all we can do is speculate, right? I mean, we, we, we wind up in cosmic territory with this yes. kind of stuff unavoidably, <laughs> but I think a lot of that is, is super well said, man. And it, and it is interesting to think like, you're right. The, the, the physical laws, let's say the absolutes yeah. order and form all coalesces around those. Right. And it's interesting to think if, in the realm of consciousness and social order, maybe we've never had an absolute before. Like we've had strong ideas, powerful gripping ideas, but maybe there's never been a social absolute. And you could, I mean, yeah. I think a fairly straightforward argument to make that at least, again, part of the religious enterprise is like trying to figure out what is the, what is 
the consciousness absolute, right? If we accept that like gravity is part of one of the absolutes in physics, but what is, what, what is the absolute that uniquely applies to human beings? And maybe this is what religion is part of, which is why God is often called the alpha and the omega, the absolute, the everything, right? And so, yep. and th then the reason why that's valuable is because just like understanding gravity, if you can understand what absolute you've been formed around, then you can align with it in a more efficient and better way, ostensibly to interact with your reality better. Yeah, and like with less error. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. it, you know, if again, if if Bitcoin is like one of the one of the yeah. an instantiation of the, the the consciousness absolute, right? Like so, definitely like an divine sort of language here yeah, right but if it if it is a manifestation of that i think what you said is right that you will be economically compelled let's say or incentivized to form around it yeah and the degree to which you adhere and align with its principles and the values that it is propagating or transmitting the more yeah. efficient and successful you are likely to be yep Sort of how like a, how like religions were fairly adaptive for quite some time. You know, it's like whether, you know, whether the the specifics of you know the, the deities or you know or or practices, um, you know, those those could be debated as as to you know the the literal uh, truth of those. The the clear outcome is that they were quite adaptive those sets of beliefs and cultures that that uh coalesced around it were very adaptive for humans for a long time and and led to the proliferation of you know you could argue christianity led to the proliferation of a western culture you know by and large and and still is a, a big part of that um, well, absolutely i mean there's a reason why yeah. I'm not aware of any cultures or civilizations that didn't have a central belief system, whether you want to call it religion or mythology or, or yeah. whatever, like it seems central and not people can take an overly simplistic or overly narrow view of this and say, Oh yeah, you know, like common identity, that's good for cohesion and that kind of stuff. But I yeah. think it runs far deeper, like in very much creating a framework for helping people, uh, understand the reality they're in and then again to construct their their system evaluation such that yeah cohesion is one of the results of everyone being on a more or less uh similar system evaluation but i think yeah and it's interesting to wonder like maybe there were cultures and civilizations of people that did not have those things but it, it yeah. was such a competitive advantage right. <laughs> yes. that only the ones that had it you know propagated and survived yeah. so I think, you know, in our modern hubris, and I talk about this, you know, quite a bit, but I think, and, and Peterson has been very uh, instrumental in, in helping me form this opinion. Although I was always very um, careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I like, yeah. I think our modern hubris has, um, is doing us a disservice in, in how it influences how we treat and in large, in many cases, dismiss the wisdom contained in religious traditions. Right. Yeah. But I, I think it's a careful balance between respecting the wisdom and the knowledge contained therein and really trying to investigate it and not, you know, not falling prey to recoiling or um, responding in like an, a, the complete opposite way and being like, oh, like I'm born again and I'm just I'm, yeah. I'm taking it and integrating it now. Like, I think we're at a very unique point in time where new systems of meaning are literally being born. And this, I mean, these very conversations are part of participating in the process of being like, what are they? What do they look like? And I, I don't think anyone ultimately is going to direct them. I think they're going to show up in our music and our art and our everything as maybe it always does. And then as it becomes more obviously in, uh, built into the world, maybe articulating it becomes a little bit more easy as well. Although yeah. you always you always have the potential pitfall of like if you get so well at articulating it, the articulation <laughs> becomes the thing and right. not the thing, that right? Becomes like the idol, to so to speak. Yeah, right. Yeah, like the Tao is the is the Tao that can't be spoken of or, or whatever, right? Like this 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 
this uh, eternal struggle between our, our mind's desire to comp increase the complexity of our understanding, let's say, mm -hmm. in the face of something that can't be nailed down, that doesn't necessarily have a defi definable parameters. And how do you negotiate that relationship? And I, and I think the genius of some of these religious myths and stories is like the, the culture hero, right? The Jesus or the whomever in, in any other system of, of belief is kind of trying to communicate how you, you balance those, those two things, right? The creative yeah. impulse of understanding and wisdom and engaging the world as an individual and the social and social harmony with the eternal unknown potential like what's the right relationship to have there so yeah yeah and i think that that's needed to properly orient the individual in a way that like can provide you know some sort of path or meaning i recall like you know it's like and peterson does a good job of highlighting this where you know it's you need an aim you need something to aim at in order to then determine any sort of truth by how, you know, your error from that aim, you know, so if you have a target, you can actually, it's, that's somewhat definable. You can actually determine, well, okay, did I, did I, did I achieve that? And, and I think religion, you know, and, and ones that have, that have gained traction, they, they spoke to an aim of like how to be a human confronting all of this uncertainty, confronting sort of like, the the chaos of existence and do that in a way that you know that provided um that i get that i guess yeah generated more meaning um yeah. and so there was an aim there and i find that's that's the biggest hole it seems in culture today is it's just like there there's no there's no aim or it's this or it's very um you know very like um you know, very short-term, you know, gratification, you know, is like, I mean, that's almost, that's almost the inevitable outcome of saying that there is no, um, you know, there is no sort of higher order, um, mm. I guess, meaning is that it, that it just reduces then to, well, what can I, what can I extract and, and gain in, in immediately, you know, around me yeah. to, to benefit, you know, myself in a, in a very, you know, very shallow way. Um, but I think that the, the truth that comes through clearly is that that's not very meaningful and people are not satisfied or, or um, fulfilled with that sort of, that sort of aim. Cause it's really no aim at all. It's like, which is almost the worst thing, you know, you can have is like what produces the most despair is like, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, it doesn't matter what I do, you know, and that just devolves into nihilism and you're just like, whatever, it's all, you know, and then it's even, then it's more meaningful just to, just to tear something down or just to, you know, and that's what we see. Um, so. And yeah. I, I, I agree, man. I think that's one of the things that's plagued the 20th century or modern, modern culture in many ways. And I, I think I, I agree that, Again, the, one of the main goals of the religious enterprise is first, it's, there's an assertion that there is a qualitative distinction in terms of what you have at the top of your value hierarchies. Yeah. Because as you say, those will determine what you do and the feedback you get from what you do. And so, you know, you can say that whatever is at the top of your value hierarchy is your God because it's what organizes and, and uh, all of your systems of valuation. Great. And so what religion, I think, implicitly and in some cases explicitly suggests is there is a qualitative distinction about what's at the top of that. This enterprise is dedicated to trying to determine what it should be, right? Mm -hmm. Like, as you were saying, like, what is the most worthwhile aim? Yeah. And like, you got to be very careful with that question, because you might just <laughs> de facto think like, oh, the aim is a material end. Well, what if it's not? What if it's a manner of being? And I think that's what these yeah. systems ultimately try to convey is that the answer is around that area a manner of being not a an end in itself and um that's i mean again that's super interesting because if you if you happen upon or if you increasingly refine the validity of your aim vis-a-vis -vis some potential 
invisible but fundamental truth, mm-hmm. then perhaps the results that, that you net as a result of pursuing that and in, in adjusting your action accordingly improve, increasingly improve yeah. until you wind up in the kingdom of God, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, well, man, this has been super fun and yeah. we will definitely uh, hang out either in, in, you know, in meet space or do this again sometime to further the discussion. But uh, yeah. did, did you want to, I don't think we even uh, addressed or uh, you didn't say the name of your, your company and where people oh, yeah. can learn more. So maybe that's a, maybe now's yeah. a good time to do that. Yeah. So we, we've got, uh, some content we've been kind of busy all summer, so we haven't updated it a ton, but some content on Instagram. Um, it's the name of the company is uh, stellar provisions. Um, and a lot of that's going to play on words like, you know, it's stellar, it's great, but also not into, you know, the systems, kind of the physics of it, you know, and, and, mm-hmm realizing that it's all derived from, from the solar energy that that's the, you know, the main sort of input on the system. Cool. Um, so, so yeah, stellar provisions, stellar provisions.com. We're, we're currently kind of working on a full rebranding and kind of professional website development. We just did like kind of a, a basic Squarespace in-house uh, <laughs> website. That's, that's functional, but it's not a, not, not quite, um, the end goal. So that that'll be coming out. Um, hopefully then the spring we'll have kind of a new full kind of relaunch with, uh, with some, some, uh, kind of refined branding and, and website and, uh, and yeah, but I think the, the best place probably right now for the, for the company in the ranch, uh, would be Instagram. And I think it's, I think it's at stellar provisions is the handle. So sweet. Well, man, I love what you're doing. Uh, so Thanks. keep it up. And I look forward to, to keeping an eye and following it. And uh, yeah, take care. And we'll talk again sometime in the future. Awesome. Yeah, great to talk, John. All right, brother. Take care.